Good morning, everyone. Welcome. You can get yourselves organized and put your feet flat on the floor. Sit up kind of straightish as we think about our presence in this room today. Thinking about our feet connecting to earth. Thinking about our heads connecting to atmosphere. How we are part, we are part of the whole. Take another deep breath. Center and be here. And we'll get started. A couple of general announcements, extra credit opportunities. The new extra credit blog prompt is up. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, when coming into full relationship with the difficulties facing Earth, it can all be upsetting. So this is a place where you can write more about that if you care to. It goes on to ask you some other questions, follow-up questions about how will you react or how will you choose? What could you do and will you do it? So that's there for you. Um, extra credit movie tonight uh, in the movie I Am um, from the director of Bruce Almighty, The Nutty Professor, and Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. The shift is about to hit the fan. Um, so this is available for you. You'll be meeting Izzy in 106 Osmond at 7 o'clock, and she will host the movie and the conversation afterward, and you can write your reflection on it and give that to your TA to reach the qualifications for the extra credit. So that's there for you. I'd like you to reflect there in your journal um, on the notes page for today. What are your top three priorities for today? What are your top three priorities for today? Take a moment in quiet. First, top three priorities. And then if you choose to talk to your partner, you can do that for a moment. And then we'll be circling back to this later on, so we aren't going to linger on it too long. This should be something that flows right from you. three priorities for today. Just want you to hold on to these ideas and we'll be coming back to those in just a little while toward the end. So a lot of the stuff, you know, you're, you're subject to my ideas because I get to sit up front and I get to wear the microphone. Um, and yet I put out these ideas, this research, the things that are going on, um, because I, I do think that there are connections to be made. I think there's value to be found. And so I bring them to share all of that information with you. Um, I've had a little bit more time in the world to play with these ideas. And what I'm asking you to do is to play with them too. And so with that, I'd like to tell you the story. Um, it's a story told by an Israeli man, and while he was in the Israeli Defense Force, 
his commander took him to the beach one day and he said, Ilyav, pick up two handfuls of sand. And Ilyav did as he told, as he was told, and the commander said, keep one hand open and close the other hand into a fist as tight as you can. And again, Ilyav did as he was told. And he said, now open the clenched fist and compare in there how much sand compared to what you have in the open hand. Which one has more? And Ilyav said, it's the open hand that has more. The open hand has more sand. In trying to hold on to the sand, we squeeze it out, right? It can't hold as much. And so when we're closed, when we're fixed in our habits, we are shut off to the possibilities, to more possibilities, right? So it seems like the safer option to hold on tight to what we have, what we know, what we believe, and yet we might be squeezing out possibility if we keep our hand open, if we keep our minds open, open to the newness, open to the possibilities. And this is what I mean by playing, right? Playing with these ideas. So I'm asking you to keep your hand open, keep your mind open um, as we continue through. Uh, so this is where we've been, right? All of the tragedies that we're facing. And last time I presented this idea that the separation from ourself causes separation from each other, which causes separation from Earth, which we talked about the words that end in C-I-D-E. It means to cut off, right? So decide means to cut off options. Pesticide means to cut off pests. So now what we're talking about here is ecocide, cutting off the connections that we have to the planet. So today, we're going to continue in these hypotheses, right? The story that our culture has been teaching us has been what's created this separation. The story that our culture has been teaching has been causing this separation that we're experiencing. So going back just a minute to the very beginning when I talked about scientists, right? We have these hypotheses Right? And then we experiment with them and to see if those ideas really fit. So that's what we're going to be going through in class today is this idea that the story our culture has been teaching us is what's caused our separation. So first we have to dive into um, what is culture, right? Culture is defined as all of these things, the integrated pattern of, of knowing of a certain group of people or a certain place could be beliefs and behaviors, depends on you know, the capacity for learning in that culture, how learning and education happens, um, and all of these other things that fit around the circle. In this case, education fitting into the child rearing methods, right? Um, characteristics and features of everyday existence, that's what makes up culture. Customary beliefs and social norms and the materials, material traits, things that we carry with us that could be racial or religious or a social group. So today we're going to be talking about some really tough stories that have shaped American culture. Okay, so going back in time to see what has led us to where we are now, this idea um, to my hypothesis that our stories have led us to this separation. So we're going to go way back. Um, on May 4th of 1493, long freaking time ago, a year after Columbus sailed the ocean blue, the Pope offered a spiritual validation of European conquest. He says that in our times, especially the Catholic faith, faith and the Christian religion be exalted and everywhere be increased and spread 
and that the health of souls be cared for, and that barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to the faith itself. So at the foundation of this is the Christian purity and doctrine, Christian supremacy that negated the value and worth of others and permitted those European Christians to assume supremacy and privilege. So from here, then, almost 300 years later, after that declaration of that pope, in 1803, um, the French had claimed this part, the Louisiana Purchase. The state names are written in there now to give you a little bit of, of centering, idea of where that is. So if you can you know, go back in time, I'm gonna use, ask you to use your imagination a couple of times in class today. So imagining being able to go back in time and suddenly this area has been claimed by the French. Um, and with that, the Declaration of Manifest Destiny came about in 1845. The idea that the United States, not called that exactly yet, but it's destined by God to d expand dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. So following what that pope said in 1493, um, using the ideas that, that we are to subdue the earth, um, that was the plan. So of the people that lived here or came here in this time, those European settlers. So in that time of 1845, keeping in mind that the Bible was written um, at the time when there was about 300 million people on the planet, James Polk, the president of this time, of 1845, he was the leader most associated with Manifest Destiny, and he uh, was also the one where that encouraged slavery, right? Which ultimately, of course, then led to the Civil War. The westward expansion of slavery was one of the most dynamic economic and social processes going on in this country in 1845. The westward expansion carried slavery down into the southwest, Mississippi, Alabama, and crossing the Mississippi River into Louisiana. Without slavery, you could not have civilization, they said. So this is the dark side of the manifest destiny, right? Revealed that the white man's belief that the settlement of the land and civilization of natural pe native peoples was preordained. It's what God said that we should be doing. And so as these settlements increased, um, it affected a large number of people. Right? Our, our virtue-bound biblical duty to colonize. And so what about the people that lived here? Um, you can't see all those little tiny words, maybe, but those are all uh, different groups of native peoples that were already living here. About 60 million indigenous peoples were living on this part of the land before Columbus arrived in 1492. About 54 million of them died between 1492 and 1900. 90% of the native people died. They perished, either due to the hands of white men directly or the diseases that they brought. Measles, smallpox, influenza. So the native people were already struggling when the manifest destiny was going on in 1840s. So now it seems kind of odd to me that the French came and declared a property where there were already people, right? They just took that space. They took ownership of that enormous <coughs> spot of land. So then it's equally disconcerting to me that the American settlers continued to disregard the feelings and the rights and the lives of these hundreds of thousands, millions of inhabitants. 
So this story of manifest destiny is one that has created what is going on now to some extent, part of our story, right? The native peoples were living within a different story, believing that they belonged to earth, um, that you could not own land, that land was independent, that we were a part of the land. And so for the settlers, unable to see that these natives lived in a different story or not understanding what that story was, seeing that it might be ludicrous that these lesser beings um, were, were on this property. So what happened next then, another important part of our story, the Native American boarding schools, cultural genocide. The mo motto of the Carlisle Indian School right here in Pennsylvania, um, which was one of the largest Indian schools, kill the Indian to save the man. So they were trying to get rid of the culture, trying to train it out of these people by cutting their hair, which was sacred to them, by refusing that they could speak their own language, by beating them um, into submission, a cultural genocide that happened here in our country. The integrated pattern of human knowledge, belief, and behavior, that culture is what they were trying to kill. There were 519 Indian schools in the United States, and there were 126 of them in Canada. So this is part of our story. It's a really important part of our story. It's a really hard part of our story. So what happens today? How does this translate moving forward? And once again, I'm gonna ask that you use your imagination pretending that you're an extraterrestrial and you're cruising placidly through deep space when suddenly you come upon planet Earth. Your team's superior powers allow you to quietly land unnoticed in the United States and begin to blend in with the Earthlings. Your first task is to observe Americans enacting their lives in a variety of settings schools, at home, supermarkets, job sites, sporting events, prisons, churches. And in so doing, you soon notice that Americans spend a lot of time working, receiving something they call money in return for their labor. You note as well that they use money to acquire all manner of things, houses, cars, clothes, food, gadgets, furnishings, property, and on and on. By tracking their daily conversations, you deduce that these Americans believe that access to stuff ensures their well-being. So it is that you summarize the story of this culture with the formula work leads to money, leads to stuff, leads to well-being. You name this story economism, because in this culture it appears that the purpose and meaning of life is viewed primarily through the lens of economic activity. Working, consuming, investing, inventing, manufacturing, buying, selling, and so forth. As your investigation continues, you find that the central purpose of schools in this society is to train young people to join the workforce thereby ensuring that the economy thrives. You also discover that the primary role of government is to pr promote policies ensuring that businesses flourish. As for planet Earth, it is regarded primarily as a supply house for raw materials and as a depository for waste. Your team goes on to visit other countries and concludes that economism is a global phenomenon. It is at this point that Mission Control directs you to determine how well this story of economism is actually working. Are people happy? Do their lives have significant meaning and purpose? Are they generous and caring toward one another? 
Is their home, planet Earth, becoming ever more healthy and vibrant and beautiful? Seeking answers, your team sets to work, this time surveying all available research archives and media outlets to assess the effects of economism on planet Earth and her people. Despite the immensity of this task, it soon becomes evident that the health and well-being of planet Earth is in decline. Climate chaos, widespread species extinction, growing ocean acidification, widespread fresh water contamination, along with soil loss, provide plenty of evidence. As for Earth's human inhabitants, your team discovers massive inequalities in wealth distribution, with the richest 1% of humans possessing more wealth than the rest of humankind combined. Strife and violence are prevalent in many households and communities, and a multitude of conflicts among nation states. Your team is forced to conclude that economism creates separation rather than connection, suffering rather than healing, and stress rather than harmony. In your report to headquarters, you posit that all this unhappiness is occurring because economism is designed to care about just one thing, maximizing income. It doesn't care if you are happy or miserable, if you are fulfilled or hollow, if you are humane or brutish, if you are gentle or spiteful. It doesn't care about the oceans. It doesn't care if the skies turn to ash. It doesn't care if you or me, our grandkids, or the planet dies, young or old, or if any of us live or die at all. It doesn't care. This system wasn't designed to. Your team finishes its report declaring, if humans continue to declare their allegiance to the story of economism, their civilization will collapse in an apocalypse marked by unimaginable suffering. Work, money, consumption, happiness, a significant story of our culture and our time that has been created by our past. Defining economism, a term used in analysis of capitalist economics to point to the social and psychic damage that occurs when all of life's richness, wonder, and complexity is reduced to merely economic dimensions. Some of you brought this up when we started talking about, you know, how the symptoms are the leaves and the branches of the trees, and we need to get to the roots. A couple of you said capitalism in that time. And that's exactly right. That's where we are in this story of economism. So in our system, what do you see here? What is the purpose of school? What's the purpose of our government? What's the purpose of Earth? Take a moment and just think about this for yourself if you want to jot some notes on your page, and then take a moment and talk to your neighbor about this. <coughs>
I know it's a lot to hash out, and I didn't give you nearly enough time. There's a lot connected to this. So does anybody have any thoughts they'd like to share at this point? Is there a microphone nearby? Uh, me and my partner we were talking about like the purpose of government, and I think that although the government may think they're here to keep peace, I feel like it's almost at a point where they're simply just preventing chaos. So really, anything under chaos is good enough for them. Mm. I hear that loud and clear. Yes. I think the purpose of school is to, um, especially elementary school, to like find your friends and find out who you are and to like grow with people around you and meet new people. Oh, I love that. Yes. Having two elementary school students and watching them do that is delightful for me. Um, and I wish that is all that it was. Yeah. I feel like the way our like world is set up like with government and everything that it kind of just pushes everyone to be the same and like fit this mold where you just like pay taxes work and like benefit the government and like the system but that's like it and then you kind of just die yeah I've been having a little existential crisis about that this morning so yes we were talking about kind of the relationship between the three of them and we decided that the purpose of school could kind of be looked at as to create people to become functioning members of society. And then the purpose of government is to kind of control that society and make it all work together. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the people that were in school use the resources from Earth to kind of do what they need to do to make that society function as well. For sure. It's all connected. Thank you. I like how you wove it all together. Thank you. Um, we were saying that the purpose of Earth is to provide for us because, like, if we didn't have Earth, then we'd probably be nowhere in life. And yeah. I think sometimes we take it for granted, but it's actually, like, a big part of our lives that we don't really think about. Huge. It's everything, frankly. No, yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I've been thinking about a lot is, yes, our government is big, and yes, it has problems, but also if you look at, like back to Native Americans, they have their own governments, even on a smaller scale, and they all have leaders. So I think although we have problems with our own government, it's important to understand what change would look like to that government, and if like dramatic change is even possible, because even down on small scales, they still have very similar um, strategies in place. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know too much about their government strategies. But would be something good for me to look up. I appreciate that thought. Yes? Um, I think the purpose of Earth is to pro provide for us, and in turn, we need to s help save Earth. Mm, thank you. Yeah. It's good. Good variety of thoughts. I appreciate that. Thank you this morning. So at this moment in human his, uh, in history, excuse me, humans are a dangerously insane and very sick species. As a testament to insanity, humans killed over 100 million fellow humans in the past century alone. No other species violates itself on such a grand scale, although there is, I did some research on this, there is interspecies killing, but not to this scale. Only people who are deeply alienated state which creates such a reality. And so our stories have played into this separation and it might not show up as killing, right? But the separation might show up as this, where you know you have your own car and you drive it into your own garage, and then you go into your own house where you have your own room, and it doesn't bode well for building community um, in the way that, that humans were meant to commune with each other. Alone Together is a book by Sherry Turkle, why we expect more from technology and less from each other. So thinking about this, this connection tool that we often carry in our hands, 
this week I've had the experience that it has connected me, having my phone and scrolling Facebook has connected me very deeply, interestingly enough, to a person that I care very deeply about, something bad happening in their family, and so I can be providing some support. I wouldn't have known about it necessarily if I hadn't been scrolling Facebook. And so there are times when it brings us together, but how many times have I scrolled and scrolled and actually just felt more alone and more separate? And it's happening at younger ages. You know, for my eight-year-old to be begging for an iPhone for Christmas is really intense. And it shows how this is working in our world, right? The idea that we think that this is a way that we communicate and connect, and in reality, with some reflection, I'd like you to find out what you really think about this. Do you feel more connected? So from there, this whole capitalistic system, beauty is a construct created by the capitalist system to make you see flaws that don't exist, to sell you things that you don't need. So connecting to where we were on Monday, um, the idea that we are feeling kind of cruddy, right, about all of the things that are happening in the world. And so the rates of addiction, different types of addiction, have gone way up. And those addictions could be, you know, drugs or alcohol. It could be to sleep medications, to anti-anxiety medications. It could be to busyness. It could be to the acquisition of stuff. Right? The shopping addiction. This is something that um, came up even more uh, during quarantine. When we were quarantining, um, you know, Amazon made a lot of money because we were shopping more. So we're taking more and more as this shopping, we're trying to fill this, what we feel as though a void, right? An empty hole someplace inside of us. And so spending more time scrolling on your phone, spending more time shopping online, we're taking and taking and taking more than we need in ways that we think are connecting us or making us feel more real, except that it's not. That's the idea of addiction, right? It's something that we're trying to feed that empty hole, um, but it's not getting there. It's not doing it. So we keep doing whatever that action is, right? So that unhappiness inside is affecting the world outside. The more that we consume is affecting our planet in very dramatic ways. So how do we break this cycle? How do we get out of it? You must first realize the prison of your mind before you can escape it. We have to realize what's going on, what, what might really fill the needs that we're feeling, and then act on that instead of being more spontaneous and you know, working, you know, doing the things that are those addictions. Um, so I'd like you to, did you pull up a website for me? Nope, okay. So in just a minute, we're gonna break this down. First, I want you to, um, if it helps for you, I, I'm a very visual person, so for me to, uh, yeah, if you can go into, uh, it'll be in that first slide, as usual, up at the top. Yeah, that one, thank you. No worries, it's okay. Uh, so if you're a visual person like me, it helps me to see things, so if you, I want to help you see a billion dollars, right? A billion of anything. So if you have, write this down if you want. If you could save a hundred dollars a day, it would take you 10 million days to save a billion dollars. 10 million days is 27,386 and a quarter years. $100 a day would take you t more than 27,000 years to get a billion dollars. 
So a billion dollars is like a mind-boggling number, right? A mind-boggling number. Today's winners and losers, this is as of um, five o'clock yesterday. Elon Musk made 2.7 billion yesterday. Um, and then, yeah, and can you imagine? Like, oh, sir, poor guy, this guy lost 5.9 billion dollars, oh, 6.3 billion? Yesterday, in one day, losing a billion dollars. Can you scroll down just a little bit for me? And so this shows, they update this every day um, about who the top billionaires in the world. The world's billionaires have more wealth between them than 4.6 billion people on this planet. Added together, the total net worth for the 2020 billionaires was $8 trillion. In 2021, there are 2,755 billionaires with a total net worth then of $13.1 trillion. It went up $5 trillion in a year. Elon Musk recently had a day where he made $25 billion. I want to point out, thank you, Elizabeth. Can we go back to the slideshow? It's just astounding to me. And I want to point out that, um, go up just a little bit. Oh, yeah, sorry. Very good, thank you. I want to point out that having money isn't bad. That's not what I'm railing on right now. I want to say that this woman, it's about the choices, the choices that we make, right? Mackenzie Scott, in the spring, she gave $436 million to Habitat for Humanity and $122 million to Big Brothers and Big Sisters. In this past week, she has given $84.5 million to the Girl Scouts, $5 million to a small town foundation, and $15 million to a company called Vision Spring. It's a nonprofit that targets the economic hindrance of poor vision for low-income tea, coffee, cocoa, and artisan workers in India, Bangladesh, Ghana, Kenya, and Uganda. So it's not just what, you know, it, that's a lot of money, 15 million, but it's also changing the lives of these people. A simple pair of eyeglasses to unlock the capacity of learning, safety, well-being for people who are vulnerable to poverty. A corrective pair of eyeglasses are immediate, leading to reduced anxiety and depression and richer family lives by being able to see loved ones' faces and expressions more clearly. In fact, Mackenzie Scott has given away more than $9 billion in the last two years. So it's not just that money is bad. That's not what I'm saying, but the capacity, how the capacity, how the inequity affects the people of this planet. It's just like saying that the resources th that we have to feed people, to provide for people, is enough for the people on the planet, but it's all distributed. It needs to get around, right? So how can we make that happen? When we're stuck in this, what are the costs of getting money? It doesn't come as easily to us as it came to Mackenzie Scott. So all of these things that, that getting money does to us, it often costs a lot to get the money. And it doesn't cost, you know, it's not just for us. It's for this planet that we care about, right? And so this ecocide, this disconnect, this separation, so there are students that have taken this class and said that this isn't an environmental science class because we do stuff like, I just did history, right? It's philosophy. And yet all of those things tie directly into what's happening to the planet. It's all connected. It's all, all, all connected. How we are raised by our culture, in and through and around our culture, 
how we see success, how we understand what success is, and it all relates to Earth, and it all relates to this disconnect that we're feeling. So what happens if we can change that and do the things that we're talking about, right? Using all of our equipment, the things that we know and the things we feel and the things we intuit, how can we use all of these capacities to change ourselves? Starts there first, right? To have these ideas, to play with the, having the handful of sand. What does it mean if I can continue to hold more? How can it help us to become more alive and more awake in our daily lives? I've shown you this, now this is the third time, right? These were the stories of the people of this culture. And it takes a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of work to shift those stories. These stories were as deeply embedded in this culture as this story of economism is embedded in ours. And yet it shifted, it changed. People showed us how it could be. And I want to say that you all in here are change makers, right? You have the capacity to do this. I have the capacity to do this in our own individual and empowering and awesome ways. Ursula Le Guin says, it was an old story that's no longer true. Truth can go out of stories, you know. What was true becomes meaningless, even a lie, because the truth has gone into another story. So the story of capitalism, of economism, of the exploitation of Earth, that story is over. We can't live that story anymore. We have to change our story. So go back to this. What are your top three priorities for today? What is it that's on your list? I'd like you to take time now and talk to your neighbor about what you have on your list, how you're feeling about it, how you felt about it when you wrote it down. Really dig in a minute. We have plenty of time. There is no reason to pack up your stuff. We have about four minutes left, and we're going to end today with your words. I want you to speak out some of what is going on for you now, and just be respectful of the people that are going to offer their teachings and their wisdom in this time. Um, I think that ultimately my priorities are still the same. I still need to do my laundry and get my homework done and call my mom because those are the things that are going to help me get through this week. 
they probably will feel a little bit more insignificant after this class, but there's still the things that I have to do for myself. Yeah, we got to do those things, right? We got to figure those things out. Calling your mom, awesome. <laughs> it's one of my favorite things, yes. So um, I wrote top three in like order, but like after the class, I kind of swapped the order around. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so I wrote in the beginning, um, succeed in job interview because I'm trying to get a job today right after this class. <laughs> um, and then second is for not forget to eat because sometimes I like forget to eat for a whole day and then. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. And then meet and hug my friends. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. So did, how, how did yeah, they? Yeah, like it just swapped around like basically. Like okay, good. Eating, hugging, job interview. Thank you for sharing. What else do you have? Yeah. Hey, so like one of my priorities is like to sleep and like just overall make sure like today is a good day for me. Um, but like after, like that was at the beginning and like just looking about like how I was thinking about it, like I was almost stressing, making sure I was okay today. Like stressing, I gotta get a nap and I gotta make sure I get my meals in. But after learning about like how, like how some people said, were saying like, oh, it doesn't feel like as important because it feels so small. But you could also take it in the perspective like you don't need to stress about it as much because there's so many bigger things. Like just take every like second and like not stress about it or like, if it is a priority, like it's still important, but don't overwhelm yourself with how important it is to you. Yeah, it goes back for me to dualism. Thank you for saying that whole selfish sort of dualism thing. We have to sometimes be selfish, right? If I don't take care of me, then I don't do this well. I don't take care of my kids well. I'm gonna make bad choices at the grocery store. If I don't take care of myself, Sometimes I have to be selfish. So take that nap. You have to take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope that you have a really beautiful day. 